Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to our read-along of Nicholas Montserrat's best-selling 1951 novel, The Cruel Sea. We read the first two parts of this book for the first segment of this read-along, which is fairly informal. It, we're not going by a strict month or any strict hard and fast timetable. The, the second installment of this read-along is the third part of this book, which is longer than the first two parts put together. And in this second part, our ship, the Compass Rose, which is a Corvette class, it is a, basically a platform for dropping depth charges. It is part of an escort of civilian shipping during the opening days of World War II on the open ocean. Uh, and our crew, commanded by uh, Commander Erickson, but with a bunch of Naval Reserve officers under his, under his authority. So we have uh, a... a Good group of people, Lockhart and Farabee and Morrill and then Baker. And the one bad egg, Bennett, is gone. In the first two parts, the ship gets its shakedown cruises. These, these civilians don't really know what they're doing. Erickson does, but he can't be awake 24 hours a day. And they also don't know what they're in for. The Corvette and the Corvette mission are fairly new with parameters that no one really knows. All that people know for sure is that just like in World War I, so too in World War II, German U-boats, German submarines, will be hunting for civilian shipping to cripple the war effort. And it's a very real concern, a very real concern, not only for allies on the continent, but especially for England, which is an island. In those first two chapters, we learn a little bit about our main characters in a couple of interviews we follow them home to their various homes one one particular crew member goes home to his little village which is just over a bridge just walk across a river from a frequent port of the compass road so he he it, when that is his leave and he's up for leave then he just walks across that bridge in one scene that we see with a friend of his to his sister's cat the cottage that he keeps with his sister Wonderful little little place, peaceful, quiet. Uh, and from scenes like that and other scenes, we, we follow our cast in their civilian life. But the star of this book is their life aboard the Compass Rose in convoy with uh, one other Corvette and a destroyer named the Viperus and a few other ships and their always changing roster of civilian vessels. At, the, at that early stage, those early chapters of this book, the Compass Rose doesn't really know what it's doing. The men don't really know what she can do. They know that she's not very seaworthy. She rolls around in high water. Uh, so they take a royal beating from the weather in those first two chapters. But almost no other kind of beating. They shake down. They get rid of Bennett, who's a bad apple. They have horrible time at sea and learn that they can expect horrible times in bad weather. But... They don't really see any action. Uh, it's this, that is the very opening of the war. And then in the chapter that we're reading today, we're in 1941, and the war is on in earnest in the Atlantic. And the Compass Rose is blooded, for real. Sees real danger over and over again on these convoys as U-boats start to increase in the area and swarm civilian shipping. At first, the equipment is very primitive <laughs> for detecting U-boats. Of course, since you can't see them, the name of the game is to come up with some technology to detect them. And in the chapter that we're reading today, the Compass Rose gets a few upgrades. The ship is, is upgraded, made materially better, and also they are given a wondrous new machine called Radar that allows them to search more efficiently for U-boats, to detect them, see their actual outlines in relation to the outlines of the convoy itself. But the main, the main feeling that we get in the early parts of this chapter is the feeling of uh, the war and what it's doing to the Compass Rose and her crew. And I wanted to read a couple of those. I like to, I like to read Montserrat, so I, if you'll indulge me, I'll give you a couple of long quotes to show you that. Uh, this, this first quote is about the increasing tempo of the war in, in the Atlantic. Uh, of this slaughter, Compass Rose saw her full share. 
It was no longer a surprise when the alarm bell sounded, no longer a shock to see the derelict humanity that was hoisted over the side after a ship went down. It was no longer moving to watch the dying and bury the dead. They, that is the crew, developed, they had to develop, a professional inhumanity toward their job, a lack of feeling which was the best guarantee of efficiency. Time spent in contemplating this evil warfare was time wasted, and rage or pity was something that could only come between them and their work. Hardened to pain and destruction, taking it all for granted, they concentrated as best they could on fighting back and on saving men for one purpose only, so that they could be returned to battle as soon as possible. And we are going to see, we see in the course of this chapter, that that is, those are brave words, but that is not true. Uh, our, our crew, I, I think it's, I think you would probably agree with me that you would not want to read a book about such a crew. If anything, they would be the villains. Uh, and that doesn't, and it uh, doesn't end up being true at all. Our, our, the Compass Rose does become more experienced. The men become more experienced, but they do not become callous and unfeeling. Uh, and th that mention of pulling men out of the water is something that we saw last time. This is still a besetting concern on, a, on behalf of every corvette, every ship that's in a convoy. If a ship is struck by a, a U-boat and goes down, it takes minutes sometimes, just mere minutes for ships to entirely disappear from the surface of the, of the ocean and leave crew bobbing behind, sometimes dunked in burning oil, sometimes half drowned, sometimes wounded, but sometimes alive and savable. But in order to save them, you have to double back, come almost to a complete stop, and make yourself a sitting target for other U-boats, which are by definition in the area. What do you do? How do you make that calculus? Our crew, Ericsson and his civilians, who are now becoming hardened to war, have to make those calculations. And Montserrat does a great job of evoking that. He also does a great job of evoking the camaraderie that the war itself starts to produce. There's a, there's a passage here that I believe uh, many, many a World War II veteran who read this book, it would have had them just nodding, just nodding their heads, probably in silence, but just nodding their heads. Uh, this, is, this is that passage. The men who manned these ships were cast in the same mold. For sailors, the Battle of the Atlantic was becoming a private war. If you were in it, you knew all about it. You knew how to watch to keep on filthy nights, how to surmount the, an aching tiredness, how to pick up survivors, how to sink submarines, how to bury the dead, and how to die without wasting anyone's time. You knew, though not in such detail as your own particular job, part of the job, the overall plan of the battle and the way it was shaping. You knew, for example, that at this moment the score was running steadily against the convoys. You knew by heart the monthly totals of sinkings, the record and the quality of the other ships and other escort groups, the names of U-boat commanders who had especially distinguished themselves by their skill or ruthlessness. The whole battle was now a very personal matter. And for sailors involved in it, there was a pride and a comradeship that nothing could supplant. For they were the experts. They were fighting it together, and they had learned what it took from a man and the mortal fury that, increasing from month to month, tested whomever was sucked in, from the highest to the lowest, down to the fine limits of his endurance. Keep in mind what, what, uh, what Montserrat is saying there. Well, the thing that is testing the men is not weariness or even in humanity, it's anger, it's fury at what's going on. And we're going to see that. That comes to a head in this chapter. Uh, in the course of these events, the Compass Rose sees horrors. Sure. Civilian ships, or even the other Corvette, the Sorrel, is lost. These ships are lost. Ericsson has to make hard decisions about which survivors to save and when and how. Uh... And we think for a minute or two that Montserrat will be, will be content with that being the full extent of the horrors that our crew sees. But no, no, there's much worse coming. And I believe that this chapter probably has the worst moment. Uh, it's, not, it's not given more than it's due, but it will stick with you. There's an incident that happens. A ship is struck in the convoy. The Compass Rose is right nearby, and they see right away that there are survivors in the water, seamen in the water. But their detection equipment tells them that the U-boat is still in the area, right nearby. And then, horrifyingly, the equipment tells them 
that the U-boat is directly underneath the survivors, who are bobbing and weaving, gasping for air, and also waving to the compass rose. They are swimming in the compass rose's direction. They are expecting to be pulled out of the water. They recognize right away the pennants. They know it's one of their own. They don't want to die. Seamen usually can't swim and would do no good to swim anyway in the middle of the North Atlantic. Erickson knows this. He sees what the situation is. And he knows what his duty is. And it's not to save those survivors. It's to drop depth charges on them. The only way to get at that U-boat directly underneath them is to drop depth charges. And so he does. He angrily checks and double checks and triple checks with his radar operator, who is Lockhart. They all know what's going to happen. He angrily checks and double checks, but when it is sure, he does it. And he isn't even given the comfort of doing this at night. The men in the water can see what he's doing. They know exactly what he's doing. And the depth charges explode and blow the men to pieces. Just rip them to shreds. Eviscerate some of them. Blow uh, one of them pinwheeling high into the air before he falls down again. And it's to no effect. No damaged U-boat surfaces. Erickson is certain. His equipment operators are certain. They are absolutely certain there was a U-boat there. They are certain that they acted correctly. But they don't get any confirmation of it. All the confirmation they have is that they killed those survivors. And Montserrat's narrative just rolls right on. There's never any thought that Erickson or his crew will be brought up on any kind of charges. There's never any thought of that. The, the reading was there. It was secure. Multiple people saw it. They had only one course of action. But it gets to them. Far from being the unthinking, unfeeling automatons that Montserrat himself has described, it gets to them. Erickson gets drunk, for instance, in one of the fallout scenes. He gets drunk. He is certain that that ship was there, that that U-boat was there. He is certain that he acted correctly. But he gets rip-roaringly drunk. It's a, it's a very touching scene where Lockhart, who's developing a kind of a father-son relationship with Erickson, Lockhart finds him uh, in his cabin, sprawled face down on his easy chair, and very gently sets him to rest in his chair. He's going to have a terrible hangover the next day, but at least you can do that. And Lockhart is a little bit out of sorts himself, to put it mildly, and says out loud that drunk or sober, you're all right, Erickson. Not captain, because he's sure that the captain is unconscious and can't hear him. But he hears a low voice saying, number one, I heard that. And there in the quiet of the cabin, he says, well, I meant it. And we never hear anything more about it. We never hear anything more about that scene. Uh we see these kinds of tragedies, there's no other word for it, at sea. Uh, and we see them over and over again, and we hear the, the crew of the Compass Rose hears them reported from elsewhere as well. Like we've been told, the tide is going against the convoys. Uh, keep in mind, this is a point when England had almost nothing to back it up. The Americans were still officially neutral. They were doing their best with Lend-Lease. There were, we are described a portion where the Americans are trying to come in around the edges of the conflict, but they can't, they can't officially be there yet. And Montserrat allows a, a passage, a brief passage of true scorn for Ireland, which is neutral. Uh, he doesn't speak, uh, Montserrat never actually or very seldom speaks anything controversial in his own narrator's voice. The narrator's voice in this book is sparsely used and usually only when it comes to the cruel sea itself, not to men. The judgments of men are usually reserved for the, the characters in the book. Uh, but he comes close when talking about Ireland and mentioning completely correctly uh, that Ireland's idea of the enemy of my enemy is my friend notwithstanding they would be crushed under heel if this fight goes the other way. They might not like their relationship with England, but they would a lot less like their relationship with a victorious Nazi Germany. Uh, it, so as it is, the Compass Rose is all alone, except for the other valiant ships in her convoys. Uh, and we're so accustomed to that life that when they get their first real long leave and everybody goes ashore, we're shocked when Montserrat gives us the civilian side of this war. 
and reminds us that it has been taking place this whole time. Bombing runs have been happening this whole time, including on that crewmate's house, in that, that tidy little house just across the bridge from the birth of, of the Compass Rose itself. That officer and his friend go across that bridge, as they've done a couple of times before. They wander down the country lanes, and they get to the house. Only, it's number 29, Dock Road. Uh, but it's not a house anymore. An entire column of bombs has fallen directly on it. Under the bright afternoon sunshine, the wreck of the little house seemed mean and tawdry. There was flayed wallpaper flapping in the wind, and half a staircase set at a drunken angle, and a kitchen sink rising like some crude domestic altar from a heap of brickwork. The house had collapsed upon itself, and then overflowed into the garden and the roadway. The broken glass and the rubble slurred under their feet as they came to a halt before it. It was not a house anymore, this place where, between voyages, Tallow had been so comfortable and content, and Watts had stumbled out a halting proposal of marriage, and Gladys had made a warm, cheerful haven for them all. It was simply a shapeless mass slopping over from its own foundation, a heap of dirt and rubbish, over which drifted, like a final curse, the smell of burnt-out fire. Some men, a rescue squad in dusty blue overalls, were picking over the ruins like scavengers who did not know what they were seeking. And they give harsh words to these two men until they learn, this is my house, this was my house, and my sister lived here. And which, at which point, Tallow and his friend are told, of course there were no survivors. We took bodies out of the ruins, and you, can, you can identify them. Uh, so we learned the civilian cost of this war as well, and the absolute imperative that we not lose. It, there's literally nothing left for that, that officer. He goes back on board the Compass Rose. The Compass Rose goes back to sea. Uh, and at the climax of this chapter, Montserrat, maybe a, lo- a little unrealistically, gives us the perfect illustration of, as the men put it, everything that they've been training for. They are out away from the convoy. They are, they are headed back. They're steaming back to the convoy when between them and the convoy, at the far distance, through their binoculars, they spot the conning tower of a surfaced U-boat. <laughs> a German U-boat is on the surface watching the convoy. And they don't know the Compass Rose is there. The man in the conning tower, unbelievably, has not simply turned around to his rear. He does not know that, that this ship that exists only to kill him has seen him and is within sight of him. Uh, the Compass Rose gets itself taut and ready. This is everything. This is not hunting for an enemy in the dark. This is everything that they've trained for. They have their guns, both long-range and personal, and they get ready. And when they're close enough, the number one thing they're worried about is that this ship, this U-boat, will disappear when they had it clear in their sights. That would be hard to explain. Erickson is conflicted. A shot at this distance, to quote from a Star Trek, would be the wildest stroke of luck. But if he doesn't take it, for all he knows, the U-boat could submerge and be lost to them, and headed maybe towards the convoy. They have no choice but to act, so they fire off a shot. It goes well beyond the U-boat, and we're told that the, the officer on board the conning station, the tower on the top of the U-boat, is turns around and is stunned as though he were in a dream. It's inconceivable to him that this ship could be within firing range right upon him without him having any idea, without him having spotted it in the 360 degrees of the horizon of the ocean. Once again, as he does, once you reread the book, you realize how often, once again, Montserrat uses uh, infidelity as his metaphor. (laughs) The metaphor he uses is how stunned a man would be if he were uh, if, 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 if how, how stunned someone, a uh, cheating couple would be if the, the wronged husband's voice were, were heard directly outside the door when they thought he was a world away. It's that much of a surprise. The Compass Rose fires again, again misses the U-boat, and it starts to descend. It starts to submerge. But the Compass Rose now knows exactly where it is and is closing on it from a stern, and they start dropping their depth charges. They are certain that they must have hit this vessel. They're certain that they must have. And it turns out they did. This is not a repeat of the incident of the men in the water. They did hit the U-boat. They fatally injured it. 
It surfaces askew. It is obviously not going to fire on them or anybody else. It has been mortally wounded, and men are, are pouring out of it before it sinks. Because the one thing that we learn, the one impression that you will get and keep from this book, is how fast a ship goes down when it's been struck by a torpedo. Sometimes it can take a long time. We're accustomed to really to that version of things, but really it can happen in minutes, two minutes. So the men are scurrying off this, this wounded U-boat and diving into the water. They're swimming towards the Compass Rose. They know what's going to happen. The key thing to do when you're on board a vessel like that is to get away from it. Because when it goes down, the suction will pull you down too if you're not a sufficient distance away. And the Compass Rose men watch these German soldiers and even paradoxically cheer them. You know, because they're doing their best. They're slogging in heavy clothing. They're trying to make for safety. At one point, right before they reach the, the hall nets to, to climb up on board the Compass Rose, right before that, one of the men in the water stops swimming, raises his arm in a Nazi salute, and yells out, Hail Hitler. Uh, that dampens the mood on the Compass Rose. They take these men on board. Most of them are alive, and it turns out that one of them is that U-boat's captain. Erickson learns this, and ha they has them all confined to, you know, under confinement with, with armed sentries. But he, as a gesture of courtesy, he has the captain confined alone in a cabin by himself and decides in an excess of spirit to go down and talk to the man. He's feeling an excess of spirit in the midst of the horrors of this war because the, the Compass Rose has done exactly what it was trained to do. Suddenly it feels real. Suddenly it feels validated. So he goes down to this captain and this is... I want to read you this scene. I think this is I'm pretty sure this is the last scene I'll read you. So I want it's a it's a little bit long, and it's dialogue, which I don't do well at reading. But I want to I want to read it to you because uh, it really is. I mean, it comes in the center of the book, the dead center of the book, and I really do believe it is the center of the book in the way that Montserrat thought about what the two sides of this war were all about. Uh, because Erickson has the thought, Erickson has a few thoughts in this scene that you wouldn't think he would have. He's a perfectly upright guy. As one of the, the crew members says it in the first two, in the first chapter, he's like something out of the movies. He's so spit and polished. But he has several thoughts in this, in this little segment that you wouldn't expect him to have. And one of those thoughts is the first one that we get, where he says there's nothing we can do with these people. They are not curable. We can only shoot them and hope for a better crop next time. Good Lord. Right in the middle of things. But then he goes to the cabin and confronts this captain. And the captain says, Hell Hitler, I wish to. And Erickson says, No, I don't think we'll start like that. What's your name? And the captain uh, glares at him, but he tells him that his name is von Helmuth. Uh, and Erickson introduces himself. And the captain says, Ah, a good German name, exclaimed von Helmuth, raising his yellow eyebrows at the at su as at some evidence of gentility in a tramp. Certainly not, snapped Erickson. And stop throwing your weight around. You're a prisoner. You're confined here. Just behave yourself. The German frowned at this breach of decorum. There was bitter hostility in his whole expression, even in the set of his shoulders. You took my ship by surprise, Captain, he said sourly. Otherwise, his tone hinted at treachery, unfair tactics, a course of conduct outrageous to German honor. Suitable only for Englishmen, Poles, and Negroes. And what the hell have you been doing all these months, Erickson thought, but does not say. He does not say it outright, but of course, the whole point of a U-boat is to catch people by surprise. And what the hell have you been doing all these months, except taking people by surprise, stalking them, giving them no chance? But that idea would not have registered. Instead, he smiled ironically and said, It is war. I'm very sorry if it is too hard for you. Von Helmuth gave him a furious glance, but he did not answer the remark. He saw, too late, that by complaining of the, his method of defeat, he had confessed to weakness. His glance went around the cabin and changed to a sneer. This is a poor cabin, he said. I am not accustomed. Erickson stepped up to him, suddenly shaking with anger. In the back of his mind, he thought, this is another thought that he has, that you would never think that he would, and it, to Montserrat's credit, Erickson would never thought that he would have this thought. Erickson stepped up to him, suddenly shaking with anger. In the back of his mind, he thought, if I had a revolver, I'd shoot you here and now. That was what these bloody people did to you. That was how the evil disease multiplied and bred in the heart. See, this is what he meant. This is what Montserrat meant by the fact that the crew was worn away, not with, with sorrow or fatigue, but with anger. 
When he spoke, his voice was clipped and violent. Be quiet. If you say another word, I shall have you put down in one of the provision lockers. He turns suddenly toward the door and calls out for the sentry. The leading seaman on duty with a revolver at his belt appeared in the doorway. This prisoner is dangerous, Erickson said tautly. If he makes any sort of move to leave the cabin, shoot him. The man's face was expressionless. Only his eyes moved moving suddenly from the captain to von helmuth gave a startled flicker of interest and he says aye aye and he disappears von helmuth's expression hovered between contempt and anxiety i am an officer of the german navy he began you're a bastard in any language ericsson interrupted curtly he felt another violent surge of anger i could do it he thought in amazement at his wild feeling i could do it now as easily as snapping my fingers he doesn't say this out loud, but he thinks it. But what he does say, he then turns to speak. I'm not particularly interested in getting you back to England, he said, slowly and carefully. We could bury you this afternoon if I felt like it. Just watch it, that's all. Just watch it. He turned and strode from the cabin. Outside, he wondered why he was not ashamed of himself. Uh, and that that ends the segment that the, that we're reading today. The next segment that we're going to do, I, I guess we'll just do this one one chapter, one part at a time. There's no there's no particular hurry. We'll finish when we finish. We'll start another book. Uh, so the next one we're going to do is 1942, and this is part four. Uh, and it's called Fighting. Because the war is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll take this up uh, next weekend, thereabouts, next Friday, next Saturday, next Sunday, whenever. I'm, I'm hoping that you're enjoying this the the few of you who are who are this is i sort of sprang this read along on you so you might not be doing it but the few of you who are doing it are reporting that you are very much enjoying this book i'm glad to hear it i don't think this thing has lost a single step in the 70 80 years since it was written i don't think it's lost a single step so i'm glad to hear that it's still working on an audience a lot of this was the war type novels that were flooding the markets in the 1950s they have lost their step, very much so. They might have period interest of a kind, but they don't work on you. This is better than that. This is one of the best of them. So glad to hear that it's landing, that it's effective. We will move on with the Compass Rose and her crew next time. <laughs> so I will see you then. Thank you, Book Two.